Hey folks, welcome back to Welcome to My World. It's Dominique, and I'm here with you again. You're probably getting sick of me. I'm here with you so much. So, happy lunchtime. I hope that everyone who's listening in live is enjoying a healthy, not too fast, not too rushed lunch during their workday. And now, this is a subject we've discussed before, uh, several times, in fact, but it's really something that I think warrants continued examination, continued discussion. And part of the reason, I'm just going to be fully honest and real with you guys, as I try to be um, in life with just about everything, um, I have really been trying to reach a flying monkey of a narcissist lately. Now, this may or may not be one of those sort of banging your head against the wall uh, type (laughs) endeavors, but it's not about me, and I really don't feel like my ego is invested in it, and I don't feel like I am getting anything from it or would get anything from it, and certainly I'm not trying to you know, recruit anybody myself because, well, I'm not a narcissist. Um, But I have witnessed, I'm just going to share with you guys a little bit about the situation. I have witnessed this situation ongoing for a couple of years now where um, a young person, I'm really not going to say more than that because there are people who listen in who may or may not know the situation, know who this person is, and I'm not out to slander anybody or cause anybody any um, discomfort. So uh, there's a young person who I think is really passionate and who is sort of at the point of just, well, you know, that college age experience, like where you're just kind of forming your ideals and perhaps there are things about you that are still forming and formulating and that you're... um, you're, you're not going to be that person in, in five years, in three years. You know, in, in ten years, you're really going to have solidified who you are. And, and probably the person you were when you were, like, for instance, in high school, um, in, in your undergrad years even, uh, you're not going to be that person, at least not completely, uh, for the rest of your life. And I feel that there is a young person who hopefully can be reached who is really being used by uh, a toxic, malignant narcissist. This person is being used as a flying monkey. It's really obvious. Um, Quite a few people are aware of this. And, and again, I'm being very cagey and very vague about, like, the situation because I, I just don't feel like it's my business to straight up just call people out or to, you know, make little hints about who I'm talking about. I don't think that would really be appropriate or helpful to anybody. But just, you know, let it be said that I'm attempting, when I find an opportunity at least, um, to do so, to, you know, show this young person that there is another way. I'm not saying, hey, don't think the things you think, don't be the person you are, but I'm saying challenge your views and challenge your preconceived notions and challenge your confirmation biases. And we all have them. I have them. Everybody has them. And, you know, challenge why anybody would be using you to get their stuff out there, right? Like if you're an exclusive platform, for instance, and and this is a good way to tell if you might be a flying monkey, folks who are listening, if you are being used as an, an exclusive platform or your business or I don't know, your website or your social media page or I don't know, maybe you have a show, a podcast or Uh, a YouTube show or something like that. And if your platform is is in any way is being used almost exclusively to get one person other than yourself (laughs) to get one person's message out there, you might be a flying monkey. Uh, And I think that, you know, 
adults in life, people who are uh who who have appropriate boundaries, shall we say? Adults with appropriate boundaries and people who are mature do not just willingly give of themselves and sell their souls to, you know, support someone else's agenda. Um, a, a well-balanced individual might share, for instance, um, let's say they've got a show, they've got a podcast. I mean, that's easy for me to relate to, so let's go go that route. Let's say they've got a podcast. So they might be interested in sharing different perspectives on on um, various subjects and various matters. And when they make an argument, they're probably going to... Uh, give a balanced and fair assessment of where both sides or all sides are coming from uh, in that argument. And they're not going to just fully rely on their confirmation bias and they're not going to try to, you know, make other people feel bad for thinking differently than they do or what have you, right? They're going to they're they're going to pretty much be fair and balanced. Now like I said, everyone has their biases, but you know, let's say you have a platform or you have a a voice uh in your particular community, uh whatever that might be. Well, it's possible that someone is going to want to use that voice for their purposes. And I think that mature adults with like I mentioned before, appropriate boundaries, uh, will notice that and and will not sort of allow for that to happen. Um, They aren't going to sit there and allow themselves to be used. But people with porous boundaries or people who are empaths but who, you know, maybe haven't established what their boundaries in life are, And by the way, when I reference boundaries, if you don't know what I'm talking about, we just did a show on that subject very recently, the other day, in fact. And I would love for you to check it out and and tell me what you think. And maybe that'll give you a little bit of context on, you know, what the heck I'm talking about when I reference boundaries. But uh, an adult with mature, uh, appropriate boundaries is going to notice red flags when things like this come up. They're not going to allow themselves to be used. They're not going to allow themselves to be taken advantage of. And a really mature person is going to be slow to judge and they're going to keep an open mind on things and they're going to try to keep their emotions from influencing rational decision making. But if they notice that something seems amiss, that somebody is trying to use them, they're going to at least consider that and think about it and and then decide consciously, you know, do I want to allow myself to be used like this or am I going to choose to stand up for myself? Now, it's important to distinguish Uh, The fact that anybody can be used as a flying monkey Um, doesn't mean you're deficient in character. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. In fact, it likely means you're a good person uh, who has uh, a voice that other people listen to. And it means that the narcissist feels that in some way you're going to benefit them. You're important to them. But why be important just to them? Isn't it more helpful to be important to yourself and to getting your own goals accomplished and and getting your own needs met, right? Um, So relying on something outside of yourself is called having an external locus of control. And that means, again, that you're Relying on something outside of yourself for reward and punishment. Um, some people rely 
are on a god for for reward and punishment, but they also usually have a balanced uh, view of, you know, hey, I control my own life. I do have still that internal uh, balance of, of locus of control with external. I'm not fully external. I don't think that God makes it a rainy day when I want it to be sunny. I don't think that God uh, dresses me in the morning and picks out what kind of socks I'm going to wear, right? So it's it's the balance that we need to strive for. Now, those who don't have balanced locus of control often have porous boundaries. And what did I just mention? Well, empaths, unfortunately, happen to have porous boundaries because we can feel what other people are feeling. We want it to be better. We want to help other people. Does this sound like anyone you know? Hint, hint, it might be you, right? I know that I am an empath and uh, I, I do have to watch myself when it comes to toxic people. Now, I also have a really um, good bullshit meter and am absolutely willing to call people out, including myself when I'm wrong. So that's where my balance comes in. I'm not a ripe target for a narcissist or a sociopath. And I have a lot of self-esteem and confidence that's based in actual reality. So again, I'm not a ripe target. I have good boundaries, not porous boundaries. I challenge people to be the best people they can be, again, including myself. And of course, they don't have to take me up on that challenge, but I want people in my life that do the same for me. I don't want yes men, right? Anyone with good boundaries doesn't. Now, narcissists do. And you, my friend, might be that yes person, that yes man or or yes woman or yes person, right? Now, a couple of things uh, will will give this away for you. Will will help you to distinguish whether you are or are not a flying monkey, and whether someone around you, someone in your life, might be a flying monkey. So, flying monkeys essentially do the narcissist's bidding. They do their dirty work. As we've talked about before, if a narcissist or cluster be in your life or someone that you know who struggles with that disorder, well, I would say everyone else struggles with their disorder rather than them struggling with their disorder, but I digress. Um, If someone you know on the cluster B spectrum or that you know of um, engages in these behaviors, they may be recruiting flying monkeys. Uh, And you can tell if the people in your life are flying monkeys or if you might be being groomed to be one. Because these people are very quickly going to be pulled into the narcissist circle. Do you find yourself being pulled into the narcissist circle? Do you find people you know being pulled very quickly into someone else's orbit, almost as if they're a black hole trying to swallow up planets for energy, right? Kind of like that. Have you seen anything like that happen? Odds are you have in life because you're an experienced uh, human being and you've seen a lot, right? We've all seen a lot in life. And so if you're seeing someone become sucked into another person's orbit very quickly. Perhaps they go from just, you know, being acquaintances to boom, being besties all of a sudden. And, you know, that, that person is now almost exclusively hanging out with the narcissist, working with the narcissist, touting the narcissist's beliefs for them, defending the narcissist to anyone and everyone, um, being their pit bull, being their gatekeeper, then odds are you have identified a flying monkey. And if this is you and you have someone in your life who you're being a gatekeeper for, odds are that you're thinking something along the lines right now of, oh, well, you know, you don't understand. I know I know what you're describing. That's something totally different. This person really needs me. They really need my help. People are down on them. They need me to defend them. They really need me to help get their word out. They are just being targeted and, oh, my God, they need my help. Well, here's the thing. An honest-to-goodness target of narcissistic abuse 
not someone who is a narcissist, is not going to need people uh, to step up and speak for them, right? Sure, we might come to someone's defense when it's appropriate, uh, in an appropriate way, now and again, but are you their exclusive gatekeeper? Do you find that there are lots of other people being pulled into their orbit too, who are their exclusive gatekeepers? Maybe you're a little exclusive club and your entire connection uh, revolves around the narcissist or the person you are attempting to defend and help and assist. If that's the case, you are dealing with a cluster B narcissist or sociopath. And this is not a diagnosis or a uh, set of, of symptoms to be taken lightly. It's not something like depression. It's not a mental illness. It's not anxiety. Uh, it's not bipolar disorder. And sadly, oftentimes, narcissists are misdiagnosed as bipolar, oddly enough. But this isn't somebody with a mental illness. This is someone with a disordered personality type. This is someone who's fundamentally unwell on a soul level. And again, we're not talking about religion. We're talking about core of existence type stuff. We're talking about the core of your being, who you are as a person. That narcissist, that cluster B, is disordered at that level. There is something severely wrong with them, and it can't be cured. And you can't cure them, and you can't help them. Now, I know you're probably still sitting there going, well, but this person really needs my help. And, and this person, oh, you know what, they're, they're really trying to do good things. They're trying to shake up the company or, or, you know, they're trying to mend the family unit. Or they're, they're just really trying to make the world a better place. <laughs> um, great, they can do that without you being their exclusive gatekeeper. Uh, that sounds like something that they can choose to do on their own. They might employ different people's assistance, but they're not going to be gathering an exclusive gang of people around them to try to accomplish this. They're going to work with anyone who's open to working with them. They're going to be open-minded. They're going to be concerned for the, for the community or the world or you know something outside of themselves. You will notice if you really are dealing with a narcissist that that is not the case. With, with an actual narcissist, not the case. With somebody who really is trying to better their community or their town or their state or their you know, country or their world or their you know, professional environment, whatever, uh, it's going to be a very different proposition. It's not going to all be, you know, self-centric, me, me, me stuff. It's not going to be, oh, I'm being targeted again. I'm being bullied again. Oh, my work is so important. And, you know, I just, I need your help. I need you to be my gatekeeper. I need you to speak up for me, right? Oh, please help. It's not going to be that if somebody is truly engaging in a selfless mission or a selfless endeavor. Now, how to identify flying monkeys if flying monkeys appear in your life? Perhaps you're not the flying monkey and perhaps you're not just associating with or loosely associated with these folks. Perhaps you have been the target of narcissistic and or sociopathic abuse and perhaps you are experiencing targeting and, and gang stalking and harassment from flying monkeys yourself. Well, let me tell you how that might look. Uh, if you were raised, for instance, by narcissistic parents, perhaps you have a sociopathic or a psychopathic sibling, right? 
If you have somebody in your close, immediate family who's a cluster B personality disordered person. Now, here's how the flying monkey targeting might look to you. Let's say your dad's a narcissist. Now, you're married, you're an adult, you don't live at home anymore. Um, maybe you have your own family. And you try to keep a distance from dad. In fact, you probably have somewhat gone no contact with dad because he is pretty toxic, right? Now, picture this. Somebody, I don't know, dad, one of dad's close friends. Now, narcissists do have close friends. Um, it really is a misnomer that they don't have friends, but those friends are flying monkeys. They're not other healthy individuals. So, you know, some distinction can be drawn there. But let's say one of dad's close friends, quote unquote, or uh, let's say your uncle Bob, your dad's brother, uh, is being, are, are being recruited as flying monkeys. So you might hear from Uncle Bob a lot. Uncle Bob might be asking you to go grab a coffee or get a beer. Dad's friend might be asking you to go shoot hoops with them or go to the shooting range or go play golf with them a lot. And when you do this and when you engage in this, it's not just going to be an innocent attempt to hang out and to get to know you or spend time with you. It's going to be a whole festival, a whole festival of, hey, you should really talk to your dad, your poor dad. Oh, your dad is suffering so much. Your poor dad, he just really misses you. Now, you're being too hard on him, and you know he didn't mean what he said. You know, I don't even know if he really said that. I think you probably just misinterpreted it. Now, won't you just give him a call? Hey, I wonder if maybe Dad could come out and join us. Wouldn't that be great? As your stomach sinks to the floor, you're probably thinking, hell no, it wouldn't be great. But you're being ambushed and targeted. And this sort of barrage of targeting and this sympathy campaign is being launched against you so that you look like a complete and utter jerk for not wanting to invite dad out golfing, not wanting to invite dad out to have a drink, not wanting to invite dad out to go shooting, not wanting to get together with dad during the holidays, right? Now, perhaps your dad was just not just, but was verbally abusive and verbally targeted you. And perhaps something more insidious happened, more, you know, more something that would affect you in a lifelong way where you wouldn't feel physically safe around them. Perhaps sexual or physical abuse uh, occurred. Now, what you're going to hear from this flying monkey or this group of flying monkeys if they know anything about these accusations, which they may not because narcissists don't like to share things with people that show them in a bad light. But if, you, if they do know about it and they, and they do say something to you about it, it's going to be, again, something along the lines of, well, you know, that was a long time ago. Your dad's really sorry. He's changed since then. Um, you know, maybe you just imagined it. Maybe, did, did it really happen like that? Maybe it didn't. I, I don't know. You know, I'm not sure that you're telling the truth on this one. Are you sure you're not misremembering it? So there will be literal attempts made to force you into editing your own memories. And this is an actual phenomenon uh, sort of a group hypnosis type of situation where even if the flying monkeys witness abuse happening to you or to one of them, uh, it just gets rewritten in their brains uh, because of the targeting that's going on and because of the sort of trauma bond that they're experiencing with the narcissist and because they can't possibly confront the fact in their own mind that they might have contributed to this awful situation and to actual abuse.
Now, that's a pretty convenient reason, isn't it? For someone to rewrite their memories, rewire, reconfigure, and just kind of say, hey, you know what? I don't think that really did happen. You know, it didn't. It really, it didn't happen. No, anybody who says that happened is lying. Well, congratulations. You're being brainwashed if that is how you're allowing yourself to live. And look, if you are the target of the flying monkeys, you're going to experience this sort of thing. So you really can't convince them that the abuse actually happened. I think the only possible way, and this is not guaranteed, folks, for someone to intervene with narcissistic abuse or attack is for a a person from the outside who is not part of the abuse, not part of the targeting, to come in and to sit down with these flying monkeys or at least with whatever flying monkey might be receptive. Because look, this person really might be an empathetic and conscientious individual deep down. And if somebody, whether it be a psychologist, um, a coach, a, a friend, somebody who works with that individual, if that person, that third party person can come in and say, hey, you know, it looks like you're really trying to do the right thing here. It looks like you're passionate and you're really trying to assist someone who you believe is being attacked but you know there's another way to look at it and it's very possible right now that you are being used to bully and abuse other people have you thought of that i think that that does work now and again with the flying monkey um in fact in fact and this isn't a pleasant thing to share for me, but um, my friend and I were both being alternately targeted by a narcissistic sociopath years ago and being used as flying monkeys. Now, we both started to realize that something wasn't right. Um, and And... When we did, for fear of being ostracized and further targeted ourselves, we both just kind of individually stepped back from the group as a whole. I thought that she might target me if I came to her and explained what I thought was going on, and she thought the same. Well, one night, we ended up running into each other, and we talked and we had a really frank discussion and we both sat for a while with each other and 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 just discussed this and just really thought on this and it after our experiences individually and as a group and after talking with one another Well, we decided that we had been part of a smear campaign. And we decided that we didn't want to be part of that any longer. And we decided that we had also been targeted. I mean, we didn't decide that. It was clear. I already knew I had been targeted. Didn't really realize she had been targeted to the extent that she had until we talked and our stories matched up. But just talking with another, you know, concerned human being really helped to break me out of that. And I would say that my friend would probably agree that just, again, just talking with another human being who was concerned and who saw and knew what what was going on really helped break her out of that. So I, I don't think that it's impossible to get through to a flying monkey. Now, before I let you guys go, I'm going to tell you that there are two kinds of flying monkeys. The first, you might be able to get through to. The second, 
don't even try. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to be honest. Don't even try. So the first type of flying monkey is somebody, again, who is empathetic, who is compassionate, who is really just trying to, quote unquote, help the narcissist because they think that they're a victim and they don't see them as a narcissist. So they're a genuine, kind, compassionate, empathetic human being, right? A caring person. Well, that's the kind of person you may be able to get through to. And unless you're personally involved in the targeting and abuse, and if you, you know, if you do think that this person is someone you might be able to get through to, go ahead. I say, I say, give it a try. It worked for me. Um, I'm living proof. And (laughs) there is that second kind of person who is just as insidious and just as toxic as the narcissist they're serving. They are another narcissist. Perhaps they're a covert narcissist. Perhaps they're a malignant narcissist, but they are another narcissist. There is another narcissist involved that the original person has recruited as one of their flying monkeys. Well, that's the person that you simply cut off contact with, walk away from, don't interact with them if you can help it. That is not somebody who you're going to be able to break out of the flying monkey mode. That person knows they're a flying monkey, unlike the first type of flying monkey I described to you. The co-narcissist knows they're a flying monkey. They know it, and they're proud of it, and they're glad to be one. They enjoy bullying. They enjoy uh, enjoy trolling. They enjoy targeting people. It gives them a happy. So don't try to break that person out of the mold. They like the mold. The mold is pretty much literally designed just for them. It's molded to them, right? So don't try to break them out of the mold. Um, They want to be there. They probably made the damn mold themselves. And you know, would brag about it if you asked them. So don't try. But if you find yourself to be that empathetic flying monkey or you think it might be possible, please talk to a third party. Talk to somebody in the mental health field who is well-versed in in narcissistic abuse and sociopathic abuse Uh, Not all of us are trained in that when we um, originally study psychology. And if we don't specialize in that, look, (laughs) folks, we're not going to learn very much about cluster B. And we might miss it entirely. And, you know, a psychiatrist might misdiagnose it. A psychologist might just kind of gloss over it and go, oh, well, it just sounds like you're dealing with a difficult person. Whatever, you know, it's fine. Here are some coping skills. Go on your way. You have to make sure that you find somebody, whether it be, you know, I know several other coaches and lifestyle consultants who are amazing, who really are very well-versed in uh, cluster B abuse. And I know several psychologists that are just as versed in cluster B abuse, And the criteria to make a diagnosis, or at least make an educated guess that somebody who isn't coming to them uh, might fall along that spectrum. So make sure that that's the person you seek help from. Make sure that it's someone who is well-versed in cluster B uh, abuse and targeting. So if you feel that you might be a flying monkey, that's who you need to talk to. I'm happy to give recommendations. I'm happy to take clients uh, via Skype or FaceTime, as well as in person, over the phone. And I know that there are many other people out there who do what I do, who are well-versed in cluster B personality disorders that would do the exact same. So please, at least consult with one of us. If you feel that you might be being targeted and might be a flying monkey, you really need to do that for yourself. Because you're going to look back on this time in your life later on and you're just going to go, oh my God, what was I thinking? Uh, I can't believe I did that. You know, this narcissist has basically uh, 
done the voodoo mindfuck on me to destroy my own reputation and live in a way that is not compatible with my morals and my ethics, personal ethics. Like they have, they have assisted me in violating my own personal ethics. They have assisted me in bringing myself down to their level and perhaps below their level. And that is something that you can't take back. You can't undo that. So get help. If you feel that you may be being targeted as a flying monkey, at being groomed, being pulled in, or if you feel that you've been a flying monkey for a while, all I can tell you is there is always time to change. There is always time to get help. Always. It's never too late. But once you kind of work your way out of the brainwashing, you're going to have to come face to face with some of the stuff that you did. And hey, let's do that sooner rather than later, huh? That's what I did. I had to do it sooner rather than later. I had to break out of that mold uh, and then look back and say, oh my God, I actually was part of this targeting campaign and, and come to grips with what I did and apologize for what I did and realize that I hurt people. You know, don't let it go on any longer than it needs to. But please do know that you can always get help. Always. And my door is always open. My door is always open. And if you are that third party trying to assist someone else to break that mold, you be that lifeline for them. They don't have to take it. They can keep doing what they're doing. That's their choice. But be the lifeline for them. Be that lifeline for somebody. Again, this is where I kind of diverge with some of the other people in mental health. I happen to think that this is a reversible situation. Sure, the narcissist isn't curable, but the flying monkeys are, uh, at least ones that are not co-narcissists. And I think giving somebody that lifeline and at least extending your hand um, could do wonders for that person. I've been there myself, folks, so take my word for it. Okay, so flying monkeys might have a funny-sounding name, but they're no joke. So thanks for listening in. I'm going to let you guys get back to work. I've taken most of your lunch hour. Thank you for spending it for uh, with me, and be well.